this was one of the early uh, uh, STEM applications, and it, it had a, a barcode element to it. To, he wanted to track honeybees that are going into the hive and out of the hive, and could barcode do that. There is not a uh, hatchery grown salmon in the world that doesn't have a barcode in it. This is the Automatic Identification Teachers Institute Virtual Edition, brought to you by the Material Handling Education Foundation, AIM, and the AIDC 100. Well, I'm uh, David L.A., and I've been in this industry for, I don't know, 40 years. Uh, who, who, who knows when to start counting? But... Uh, my present company is PathGuide, and I started that 32 years ago. Uh, my name is Mike Nolan, and I'm the founder and the current president of a 36-year-old AIDC company uh, called AIS. Bragg Ackley. I work for Digimark Corporation. What is the most unusual or surprising use case for AIDC that you've come across that you're allowed to share? Okay, so I thought about this a little bit, and uh, I've come across a lot of them, but the ones that come to mind are they're not necessarily super technically challenging in the barcode arena, but they, they are just interesting, and they, uh, they have an element of uh, barcode or RFID associated with them. So the, the first one is uh, we were asked one time to participate in a, an educational uh, program in New York City. It was a, a STEM, an early STEM project in New York City to help teach uh, kids a little bit about science and math. So the project involved us building a barcode scanning uh, apparatus, <clears throat> custom built scanning apparatus into a uh, hurdy-gurdy type organ grinder. Uh, this was a, a fairly large thing that looked like a standard organ grinder that you would see in the old uh, movies of old New York City. It had large wheels and it was uh, uh, drawn by the, the organ guy himself, you know, and, and uh, it was very colorful, it was painted nicely. And, and the challenge was for the kids to insert a, a barcode tag uh, into a slot that uh, was part of our apparatus. And uh, we'd read the tag, and depending on what the barcode was on the tag, we'd either bring it back in and keep it in the machine, or we'd send it back out to them. So this was one of the early uh, uh, STEM applications and it, it had a, a barcode element to it. A second one is that we, at one time, had a, a relationship with a very large uh, healthcare company. Uh, they asked us to develop a, a custom barcode terminal. Um, and this was a small terminal and this was around the time prior to uh, smartphones and things of that nature. Uh, about the most technology that was around was uh, small portable data terminals. Uh, some of them were uh, just coming out at that time. So anyway, we built a, a data terminal, essentially. It was a networked terminal. It had barcode capability. And uh, we used it to help this company secure some employees uh, they were trying to recruit people out of a, uh, a university in Boston that had a, a program where they had identified uh, re really talented people. And the company that I was contracted with was uh, trying to get most of those people to work for them. So we were very successful. We, we uh, distributed uh, the, the, the terminals that we built <clears throat> to the uh, prospective employees and uh, it resulted in most of those prospective employees actually applying for employment with my contracted company. So those are two, uh, what I thought were interesting things. They have a little bit of barcode in it, but they, they also have a, uh, a flavor of uh, the aura or the, you know, the feelings about barcode. Intermec at the time uh, developed the first uh, 2D symbology that uh, that was scannable, it's called Code 49, and it was a 
the, the first, what is now called the stack symbology, uh, which is basically rows of linear barcodes. Uh, and the laser scanner uh, could only read lines. Nowadays, of course, a camera can read it just fine, but stack symbologies aren't really used anymore in new applications because you can use a matrix symbology, which uses much less space and has a much can have more error correction and uh, and all that. But at the time, you know, laser scanners were still a big thing. And in fact, this was before imagers were even, uh, you know, on the drawing board. And uh, David Allay invented this uh, this wacky thing called Code 49. And I was uh, fortunate enough to be there and, you know, contributed my ideas and as did many other engineers at, at Intermec at the time. Uh, and it, it was introduced at Scantech and made a big splash. And this guy came up to me and said, oh my God, that must be what I'm going to need uh, to mark honeybees. And of course, it's just famously Steve Buckman at the University of uh, Arizona, I believe, uh, was studying honeybees. And, you know, honeybee uh, success is crucial to pollination and, um, and there's been a lot of problems with honeybees dying off and they, they were studying honeybees. And he had this little rig where he, by hand, so honeybees, if you cool them down, they kind of, kind of slow down. And grad, he had graduate students like sticking on these tiny little numbers, you know, like 14 on the back of the honeybee. And then the honeybee would have to go through this like tube uh, to get to the hive and they could kind of tell how long they were out foraging, you know, classic, you know, you throw a team of graduate students at something and, you know, that's how you get something done. And he wanted to make that little thing be scannable. And at the time there was nothing that you, there was no, there, no way you can make a barcode. Uh, I mean, we're talking like a, you know, a mi one millimeter by three millimeters in, in size. Um, and it had to be lightweight. And so uh, I, I said that code 49 was not what you needed. Code 49 could encode up to 50 characters. All he needed was basically two digits. And so um, I realized that the most efficient barcode for that is the famous interleave 205, which is uh, used, it's the barcode used on corrugated boxes uh, you know, for decades. And and it's still out there being used all over the place. Uh, you know, you still see it. But if you just have two digits, then you only need seven bars. And at the time, there was no way to make this small enough uh, to be scannable. Uh, and when you made it really small, the, the bars and spaces um, were difficult to, uh, to uh, resolve with a laser scanner. And at the time, I was developing a measurement device for measuring print quality that was super high resolution, and I could change the aperture on it. And so I, uh, I was able to develop uh, a barcode that was essentially distorted, uh, so it looked kind of weird to the naked eye, but it was distorted in a way to compensate for distortions in the, in the printing and the scanning of it. Um, which basically meant that I made the bars visibly skinnier than the spaces, but then the distortion from the substrate made them look equal size to a scanner. So I was able to uh, both make a technological leap in, in that uh, taking, you know, removing that scanner and substrate distortion from the symbol. And I worked with, um, uh, a little company called Data Composition down in California who had a very, very high resolution photo composed label uh, making setup. And through many iterations of me measuring it with this machine and them making it, they finally came up with a highly distorted little tiny barcode that Steve stuck onto the bees and scanned with his laser and set up this automated thing so he could just detect the bees coming and going. And he wrote a little paper about it. 
And at, then it just went all over the place. It was uh, when I got a request from a uh, professor at the University of Arizona to, he wanted to track honeybees that are going into the hive and out of the hive. And could barcode do that? And so I came up with a, I said, okay, how many different bees do you want to identify? You know, Oh, less than 100. Okay, yeah, fine. So what I did, I said, okay, we'll use two-digit interleave two of five is about the shortest standard symbology. One could invent a custom symbology, but then you'd have to write the decode, encode, and everything else for it. So that, that gets a little heavy-handed, whereas we could miniaturize this. I kind of forget the X dimension that we used, but it was, it was way down there. These labels were prepared basically photographically because you know the regular printers don't print X dimensions that small. But uh, we, we had these label, little, little, little film labels that he could stick on the, he would, first of all, he would take the B and he would cool it down to however cool you have to get the insect so that it's it, it's not dead, but it's asleep. So it's, that's the anesthetic for the bee. And then he could handle them without getting stung. And he would put a little drop of shellac on the bee's back between the wings. And then he glued this little barcode on the bee. And then he had a, a transparent plastic tube that the bees had to, to walk out of and walk into. And for some reason, they, they were usually right side up. I mean, I guess the plastic was slick enough, they, 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 they didn't choose to be upside down. So most of the time the barcode would be on the top and he had a, you know, and it wasn't even an omnidirectional scanner, I think it was a line scanner. But most of the bees, most of the time, he could scan B43 is going out at 2.25 p.m. and so many seconds, and then comes back in at, at 2.42, and he can say, well, the elapsed times, you know, 22 minutes and 15 seconds. He wanted to know how long is the bee gone. And then being an entomologist, he could say, well, they fly about so fast and usually more or less in a straight line. And so they're, they're probably about this far. And then he could also sample the pollen that the bee brought back that would be aggregate, not each bee, but the aggregate pollen. He could say, well, there's a clover field not this far, it's about, that's about right. That's where a lot of the bees are going. Some of them are going somewhere else, but he was trying to figure out bee behavior. But, but my part was really just designing the labels and providing a, a, a special high density uh, linear laser scanner to scan the bees. That was by far the most unusual. There is not a uh, hatchery grown salmon in the world that doesn't have a barcode in it. <laughs> All right. So that one is a little bit of an inside job. Um, so a little bit background. It, it was, it's been well known for a long time. Uh, you know, fish and, and people, you know, all animals in, in their ear uh, have various, uh, you know, little microscopic structures that you know, use or use for sound uh, detection and stuff. And the, and the little bone in the ear of a fish, uh, and, I, and I believe in, in, in many uh, animals, is called an otolith. And during the, uh, the, you know, incubation phase of fish, um, each day the otolith uh, microscopically grows and it's it's a it's a it's a um it's a calcium crystallized based material and so another layer forms and if you grab a wild fish uh and and take you know and you know eat it uh and then take the otolith out and section it look under a microscope you'll see little concentric rings and that represents the I think somewhere around 
you know, 10 or 15 days of its life, you know, when it was developing, uh, you know, prior to, to hatching and everything. And, or maybe just after hatching prior to developing into what looks like a fish. I'm not so much good on the biology end, um, but um, th this naturally occurring um, phenomenon was, uh, was being studied by a very good friend of mine uh, who I, did, I didn't know professionally. I, I, he's my ski and kayak buddy, uh, Eric Volk. And Eric was a fisheries biologist at the, um, the Washington, Washington State Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife. And he uh, was doing some research on these otoliths with the eye uh, towards marking fish uh, in hatcheries. And what he discovered was that if you cool the water in a hatchery um, just slightly, like like one or two degrees C, the speed of the growth slows. So you can, the ring is slightly bigger. And, uh, and you know, he's a scientist type and we're, you know, dragging our kayaks in the wilderness to, to a, a river that, you know, had never been run. And we'd be just talking about this stuff. And one day he's telling me about all this, you know, encoding data basically he wants to encode data in these otoliths and you know he's just thinking well if i just you know i'll invent something where if it's a wide and a narrow narrow that's a one or something and uh and what he didn't realize is that it's important to have uh some difference between the different characters. So if there is a little bit of an error, uh, you can detect that error. And in the barcode world, uh, we call that a self-checking property. And in the, in the mathematical world, you, it's called a hamming distance, and you want to have a hamming distance of at least two. And so the early barcode symbologies, like code 39, you can have a character that has two wide bars uh, and three narrow bars, but if it has one wide bar, you know that it's false. It's a false character. If it has three wide bars, you know it's a false character. So I wrote up a little symbology uh, that was loosely based on, um, on the two of five symbology, which is a very old uh, symbology, one of the first ones actually ever developed, it was used at GM in the 60s. Um, and, uh, and I wrote it up, it, 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 kind of a little bit of a tongue in cheek thing, um, but it solved a big problem for them because then they were looking under a microscope and you know, you cool water by two degrees C, that's, that is, this is not like a thermal transfer printer, you know? So you have, sometimes it didn't cool quite enough and it depends how windy it is and these are in, you know, outdoor fishery uh, pools and stuff. And, and so the, the wides and narrows weren't always all that easy to see. And with this two of five pattern, uh, it was very easy to detect if they had an, an error. And, uh, and so Eric wrote this paper where he described cooling the water to, to generate these rings and uh, he included my, you know, two of five symbology for Otolis. And so it was my first peer-reviewed scientific paper uh, where I, that I was an author on, but I didn't really do much. It was all, all Eric's uh, work. And then he, uh, he implemented it at, at a massive scale um, and went on international meetings and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, and to be honest, other patterns have developed by different national countries, so fish, you know, can be di distinguished between different fisheries. But basically, the politics of fish is a huge thing, and, you know, fisheries get money based on how successful their, uh, you know, their spawn 
go out of the ocean and come back. You know, salmon is a big is a big industry, and so uh, this it's basically every every fishery uh, um, hatchling has a barcode grown in its in its otolith. It's every, it's it's been going on for twenty years now. The final generic question I wanted to ask about was, have you run across a use case where you're talking to a customer about the problems they're having and they're telling you they think you they want to use automatic identification and you have to, in all honesty, tell them, listen, this is a bad idea. Don't do it, whether it's because of return on investment uh, issues or known technological issues or, or whatever the, the cause would be. Well, okay, the re return on investment issue usually boils down to where an organization is just too small. You know, if you've got a warehouse with three guys in the warehouse and sometimes one of them works the front counter, you know, kind of thing, you, 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 you can't improve on labor efficiency. You're not gonna get rid of one whole guy and even if you were, it wouldn't, it wouldn't support the cost of the system. So you, you really want to get up uh, sometimes five people, eh, maybe 10 is much better. Uh, more typically 15 or 20 guys in the warehouse, you're going to have some people that are good workers, some people that are good loafers, some people that sleep on a pile of rags in the back, you know, and, and by tracking what they do, you can figure out who's working exceptionally well and exceptionally poorly. And the ones in between, in between training, encouragement, dismissal, whatever, whatever your methods are, you, 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 can, you can raise the productivity of your warehouse. Uh, so the place where, where we run into where we really can't help them is typically where, for example, just recently, one of our good barcode customers, one of our good system customers, I should say, is building a new warehouse. And they want us to help them figure out how to you know, arrange their warehouse. So I wrote them a very nice letter that I'm really pleased that you're, 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 you're gonna be doing this and this will be really nice for you. We really don't do that kind of work, but the following two highly reputable companies are in the consulting business to, to help lay out your warehouse. And I gave them two names. I think when they find out how much those people cost, they're gonna figure out they're gonna do it themselves because they're not that big. But uh, there's some really good companies in the business that will get in and figure out Where's the racking? Where's the conveyors? You know, what, what are you going to do here, here, and here? How are you going to organize the flow of materials? That's the business they're in. And we don't, we don't try to eat their lunch. We, we, we encounter a warehouse as it is and say, okay, how can we lay our system on top of this so that it becomes more effective? I don't know if we hear it quite as much as we used to, but back in the 2000, probably 2005, 2004, 2006 timeframe, we kept hearing that RFID was gonna kill the barcode. Has it, and, and what, do, what is your response to people that are still occasionally claiming something to that effect? What do you see as the most important reason for a company moving into, as we move into the future and look into the future for adopting auto ID? Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe, like, and we hope to see you next time on the Automatic Identification Teachers Institute Virtual Edition. <laughs>